This is the story of Frank Ziska, Modern Day Diogenes. Written by Greg Dratsab Huffman. Dictated and read by Andrew Joseph Denikashe IV. Ah, Shababa Mahala, ah, in Jesus' name, ah, Shababa Dada. Douglas looks up from his guitar. His hands pause from fiddling with the guitar that is sitting in the open case, and he glances over at Bill while shaking his head. God dangies, Bill. Do you have to do that silly business again, asks Doug. That glassy, uh, glossy... Frank glances up from his book at the two of them and helps Douglas on the way. Glossolalia. Thank you there, Frank, Doug says. Doug, you should really think about inviting Jesus into your heart, and maybe you wouldn't be so cynical all the time, says Bill. No thanks, Bill. I already have enough clogging my heart as it is. All three of them are elderly fellows. Doug is a bald, black man with some gray whiskers for a mustache. Bill is a balding, Jewish-looking fellow with big, naive eyes and well-built despite his condition. Mr. Frank Ziska is a disheveled fellow who Douglas likens to an immaculated Jesus, Jesse the Body Ventura. They sit in a moving freight car with Frank's lantern as their only source of light. Douglas pulls out his guitar and says, How about a song, fellas? What should I play? How about I'm lost and I can't find my way home? Frank turns a page, points to the lantern and says, Please, you two have made enough noise as it is. Just calm down and relax a little. I want you to use this lantern to read, and I don't need you guys bickering and distracting. Well, I guess that'll just have to be all right, won't it? I guess Mr. Ziska here needs his light. I guess we don't need to play my guitar after all, do I? I suppose I can just give up on what I want to do so you can enjoy yourself. Frank seemingly pays no attention. And what is Mr. Frank Ziska reading today, huh? Frank is lounging in a pair of pajamas with white Velcro shoes that show the um, accumulation of dirt from his travels. Frank puts one finger to his left nostril to close it and then blows his right nostril clean but doesn't respond to the query. Douglas leans over and inclines the book to identify it. Douglas laughs for a bit and then says, Atlas shrugged, huh? Oh, this is a fun irony, Frank. I'm sure we can appreciate it, right? Maybe I was Atlas, and now I've decided to shrug, Frank responds. And yet the world goes on without you, doesn't it, Frank? Maybe when the Atlas shrugs, the inhabitants of the world are initially unwilling, but most adapt and hold the world up together. I know you love your philosophers, Frank, but would you like to hear what the wise, honorable philosopher Testicles had to say about these matters, Doug jokes? That's cute, Doug. Having some fun by mixing a dick joke with Greek language, says Frank. Oh, whatever. We can talk about testicles later, but I'd hate to make you forget what you were reading about, so please, by all means, Mr. Zitska, get back to it, responds Douglas. It's fine. I'm taking advantage of the Zygarnik effect, says Frank. Douglas shakes his head and laughs. You know, Frank, sometimes I think you don't even know what you mean when you say the shit you say. It's all a bunch of pseudo-intellectual garbage. Frank says, Doug... I know you think my head is up my own ass. No, Frank, I know you are so full of shit that there is no room left to fit your head up there. Frank smirks and says, <laughs> Anyway, you're calling me a pseudo-intellectual is basically the opposite of a backhanded compliment. It's more of a, say, a back-patting insult. Since I do know what I mean when I use the words I choose to use, I think the word you are looking for is pretentious, isn't it, Douglas? Yes. Yes, I guess we can compromise on that word, Douglas responds. No, I'm not compromising. I'm not agreeing with you that, I, that that is what I am. I merely, I am helping you correct your own subjective conclusions about me. 
Bill finally decided to get in on the conversation. Frank, if you like reading books so much, why don't you try reading the Bible? I did. I, I read it once a long time ago. Bill says, well, I've read it three times. So I think I may actually know more than you do about something for once. Frank, Frank responds, I'm sorry that your memory has faded or that your power of recollection isn't as gifted as mine, but I read it once and that was enough. Bill frowns and looks down. I, uh, I'm sorry, Bill. Douglas and I just get heated when we banter. I, I didn't mean to take it out on you, Frank says apologetically. It's fine, Bill replies. Now, Bill, Douglas chimes in. The environs we are going to be headed towards, you might get to see a jackalope. What's that, Bill asks. Oh, you've never heard of them before, have you, Billy? Nope. Frank starts to say something, but Douglas cuts him off. Whoa, 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 Frank! Now let me just explain what I'm trying to explain here, okay? Look now, Bill. The jackalope is a mix between a jackrabbit, okay? And it has antelope horns. They're rare, but they exist in this part of the country. Bill's eyes light up. Bill says, wow, I can't wait. Frank shakes his head. The train begins to slow down until it comes to a complete stop. Frank says, Number 47, Tennessee, here we come, and blows out the lantern. All three of them hop out of the train car. Doug has his guitar with him, and Frank snatches up his lantern. They begin walking down the road, trees surrounding them. The wise testicle says that you can either have fun or you can spend your time learning new things, die and forget it all, says Doug. You just had to get one of those stupid jokes in there, didn't you? Anyway, I'm having fun, says Frank. Welcome to the tree state, boys. Nature is sure beautiful, isn't it, Doug says. Frank jumps in. Sure, when all you've seen, the worst a man can offer, the best offers in nature look wonderful. But nature is too harsh to enjoy for too long. It is best to keep in short bouts because the grass looks greener always on the other side, which is fitting to say at this opportunity, but it is beautiful by contrast because all we have seen are the dilapidated structures that man gave up on whereas nature looks best when completely abandoned by man. I thought you were having fun, Frank. I am. I'm just being polemic with you, Douglas, says Frank, while grinning. Doug responds, well, shit, Frank. What about all the noise pollution and light pollution we had to deal with? Doesn't relax your ears and your eyes. Frank says, sure it does, but too much quiet has the same effect as too much noise. Whereas Aristotle said that we need a golden balance, we need a little of both. Nature won't feed my belly, which is why we are passing through nature to eat. Wise Testicles says, shut the fuck up with that Aristotle bullshit, Frank. Frank adjusts his nutsack around his pajamas while walking. We could always catch a squirrel or something to eat, you know, like noble savages. Maybe when we can find one of those jackalopes and eat them, maybe they taste good. I like trying new foods, Bill says gleefully. And one of us knows how to set up a trap. Which one of us here can run? Any one of us here have stamina for that, says Douglas. Douglas turns to Frank. Speaking of Frank, do you miss owning a house? Why the fuck would I? So I can wake up in the same place every day? Right now, I'm always traveling, always traveling, always traveling. Should I need a house to store my shit? What do I have to store? Do I need one so I can invite people over and say, look at all my shit? I carry all my necessaries, my brain, a car, ample food. Both would make me fat and out of shape. I enjoy everything I eat now because I don't know when I'll get to job. A job, huh? A job is something to sustain your free time and provide the funds necessary, but a library is free, so what would I buy with it? They say you never know what you had until it's gone, but then if I got it back, I think I'd realize that it really was a piece of shit. Douglas says to him, do you want to die like this? And Frank turns to him and asks, how would you prefer to die? Shit, Frank, I'm not gonna lie. I miss owning my own construction business. I miss when we used to all work there together, building houses and producing things. It gave me a sense of purpose, says Doug. We have a goal now, says Frank. I suppose you're right. Sometimes, Frank, I wish I hadn't have dropped out of college, you know. But they stuck me in this math class, man, and they handed me a piece of paper, and it 
looked like a fucking calculator, puked all over the motherfucker. And then they expected me to clean that mess up. Doug paused for a minute. Well, I suppose it wasn't much longer after that when we met in Okinawa, was it? Remember what they used to call me? Please, Doug, don't go into your spaceman story again. Well, Bill usually appreciates when I tell it. They look over at Bill. Bill seems to be closing his eyes while he walks in, whispering in tongues. Well, that makes sense, Frank. As you, says Frank. As you can see, he loves to indulge in superstition. It's not the same, Frank. Gah, Denise, you just don't understand. They continue walking. Frank tears out a page of Atlas Shrugged and dips his hand into the back of his pajamas and into his ass crack. The fuck, Frank? Well, what? It's a page I've already read. The fuck is wrong with you these days? It wasn't even shit. I just had some sweat in my ass. It's not a big deal, Douglas. Douglas shakes his head. Frank continues. I'm just respecting the book like a butcher does one of the animals that he must carve up, trying to use every part that he can, and letting as little to go to waste as possible. I'm respecting the book by not letting it go to waste. As they sit, Doug looks at Bill's hands. Shit, Bill, what the fuck is wrong with your hands? It's fine, they just swell up sometimes when I go on walks. Are you going to be okay, man? Oh, I'm fine, yeah, it happens all the time. Shit, man, I've heard it claim it before, but I think you literally might be allergic to exercise. <laughs> Doug starts laughing. I'm sorry, man, it's funny shit. I can't help it. Look, guys, Bill shouts, a trail, Doug says. We probably shouldn't be running off on no trail in the middle of the night, Bill. You mean because of them jackalopes and all? Yeah, because of them. And also because this is... Appalachian Territory, Bill, and we could get all deliverance raped. Besides, when the sun comes up, and when we reach Gatlinburg, we'll have plenty of time to fuck around amongst the bushes and trees. Right now we get need to get into town, though, all right, Bill? Bill pauses for a moment and then says, So, Doug, you said you were going to tell your spaceman story again. He's not going to tell the fucking spaceman story again, says Frank. I told you! says Douglas, while smirking at Frank. Frank picks his nose. Doug reminisces for a while, and Bill begins praying. Lights are seen out in the distance. I think that's an 18-wheeler, wheel, wheeler, pals. Maybe I can score us a ride, eight, says Frank. Ask gas or grass. Haven't you seen any of them bef saying that before, Frank? No one rides for free. How big of a favor are you going to do for him, asks Doug. You let me handle that, says Frank, as he sticks out a hitchhiker thumb. The truck stops. Frank walks up to the door to have a chat with the driver. Doug turns to Bill. Say, Bill, what are your views on homosexuality? I think it's an abomination to God. Well, if it wasn't for the fact that I think Frank may already be a walking abomination of God, or at least of nature, I might tell you to take the path of the three monkeys. But I suppose it's too late for that. Frank runs back to Bill and Doug and says, All right, Palios, we got ourselves a ride. You two jump in the back. They do so, and Frank hops in the front, and the truck departs. The trucker pulls his pants down, and Frank braves the obstacle in the way of his mission as he endures the taste of dirty sweat, urine, and the acrid sensation of battery acid. Bill and Douglas are sitting alone in the back of the truck. Well, Bill, you've been quite taciturn lately. What's on your mind? I think I feel, I feel, I feel that good things are in store for us, Douglas. I think God has a plan for us all, and we will all be happy once our mission is complete. I think God will reward us for seeing it through. I don't think God cares too much for me, Bill. There's only one God, Doug. But God hating on the spaceman ass nonsense. Well, I guess whatever happens will happen. And it'll just have to be all right then, won't it? You will see, Doug. You will see. Frank joins them. So, Frank, did you do him a big favor, asked Douglas. Trust me, it was a rather small favor, says Frank. I'm surprised you handled that shit so well, Frank. I'd be a little pissed off. 
Well, I've heard the saying that it's better to be pissed off than to be pissed on, and maybe I got the worst of the outcome since it tasted like getting pissed on. Bill responds, But the wise distinctly tells us that getting pissed on don't mean pissed off, maybe you enjoy it. Frank doesn't respond, so Douglas continues, I took up for you the other day, Frank. Someone said you must be a homosexual, so I told them that to be a homosexual, you had to enjoy sucking dicks, and that you don't enjoy it, so what do you say? Well, maybe I did. Bill says, I just wish we were in Gatlinburg by now. Well, wish in one hand and masturbate in the other one and see which gets filled up faster, Bill, says Douglas. Oh, that reminds me, says Frank. As he gets up and turns around from Bill and Doug, Frank drops his pants and starts stroking. The fuck, Frank? Frank grunts and shoots his load into his hands and pulls up his pants. He turns around and starts laughing and streaks his hand through his hair. I just needed something to keep the wind from blowing my hair into my eyes. That is some gross shit, Frank. Why would you do that? You keep telling me I lost my shit in Okinawa, and look what you are becoming. And with the amount of grease in your hair, don't expect me to buy that store anymore. The fuck I think you get off on. And Doug pauses for a minute, wishing he had used a different word, trying to fuck with me and gross me out. Bill doesn't say anything, almost as if he doesn't understand what had just occurred. Frank, still laughing, says, You know, people that don't know me always refer to me as stranger. But from now on, I think my friends will refer to me as strangest. The truck comes to a stop, and the three of them pour out. They finally arrive at a homeless shelter. And I'm glad we're finally here. I hope they have some food and shit, says Douglas. If I haven't lost my fucking appetite because of you, Frank... You've been really acting weird lately, like weirder than normal. Frank responds, I wonder if you would say that because I'm actually acting weird, which is normal for me, or if I'm acting normal for once, which is weird for me. They walk into the building, and they have to go through a process. One of them, one of the gentlemen working there takes them into his office, and they line them up. Behind them is another fellow that is operating the shelter person talking to them asks for a name and for some information about them. The person behind them surprises them when his first words is a question is, so have you gentlemen been saved by our Lord Jesus Christ? Doug and Frank nod slowly and reluctantly while Bill nods eagerly. Yep, says Douglas. Yeah, says Frank. Yes, sir, says Bill. The gang is finally fed and they begin to socialize in the cafeteria. Frank, the misanthrope, sits alone in the corner. Douglas takes up his guitar finally, and Bill sits watching him play while telling jokes and stories between songs. What you fellas think about my Gilbert guitar? You know, like that video game where you bounce up and down on them 3D cubes. The guitar that Douglas owns is black and white has layered 3D blocks just like the mentioned video game. <laughs> Let me tell you gentlemen about a friend I had that tried to commit suicide by overdosing on antidepressants. However, he took two and felt better, so he decided not to take the rest. A few scattered laughs are heard. Okay, who likes Tom Petty? Douglas begins playing Won't Back Down. And I won't back down. Hey, are you Frank? My name's Carl, man, walking up to Frank says, Your friend Douglas was talking about ya. Well, that's awful kind of him, so why aren't you being annoyed at resident fellow you see back here? Frank says, When everyone is shouting, the quiet man shouts loudest. Carl asks, The hell's that supposed to mean? It doesn't mean shit. I'm just a pretentious asshole spouting purple prose, or rather, I'm a pseudo-intellectual, since I say shit that sounds like it means something to confuse people, and I just end up <sighs> confusing myself. I like making people think, Carl, but more importantly, I like making people waste their time while thinking. I like to put them on a path that leads to a dead end. Do you understand? Well, no, I don't. We got plenty of crazy people in here just like you, says girl. Like me? Probably not. 
Well, maybe in some ways, I suppose, they are, or at least could be. Well, it was nice meeting you, Frank. And I've had a wonderful evening, but this wasn't it, says Frank. Say what? asks Carl. I'm just fucking with you yet again. I'm simply quoting a paraprodisiac in of Groucho Marx. Ha! You crazy bastard! Carl walks off. Doug finishes the song while that he was playing, takes a sip of his soda. Carl asks him, Hey Douglas, do you need some ice for your drink? The infallible testicle says that ice only exists to put time limit on one's drink, so I shall refuse on that wise philosopher's sound advice. But thank you for asking, old chap. However, you may shine my shoes, servant. And fuck you, man, Carl says while laughing. Besides, I don't think you can shine your sneakers, retard. Uh, what do you call me? <clears throat> Someone may accuse you of having a lot of balls say something like that to me, but I've got your back, friend. I'll take up for you and set them straight and tell them that they have you all wrong. You have no balls. Carl chuckles and said, good one, you cocksucker. What's that again? I must be getting deaf in my old age. Would you step a bit closer so that I can hear you? Carl responds, are you kidding? You smell off. I'm not going near you. Well then, tell your mother to wash that stinky pussy of hers because I was in it all night. I didn't enjoy your mother that much either, dog, because she sucks dick at sucking dick. <laughs> Doug nods and says, Carl, I like you, but some people also like eating cat shit, so I suppose what one likes doesn't carry much merit these days. Alright, who wants to hear the story about how I got the nickname Spaceman? Bill says eagerly, yes, tell it! Carl says, I'd like to hear your story. Frank puts his palm to his face and shakes his head. Douglas puts his guitar down and takes a sip of his soda. Cola. <clears throat> you see me and my friend Frank there. Doug points to Frank. We were in the military together. We served in Okinawa. While over there, a buddy of mine had a box of cereal. I looked at him and said, If you reach for the bottom of that bag of cereal, you will find an astronaut toy. And sure enough, he reached in there, pulled out an astronaut. He was astonished and asked me how the fuck I knew it was in the box. I told him as I just knew it. He handed me the figurine and since then... People call me the Spaceman. Carl claps. Good story! Douglas responds, Cool down, friend. That's not the end of his tale. That's not the end of this tale. After he gave me a Spaceman figuring, it gave me, well, powers, I guess you could say. One day when my Marine buddies were driving around town, I held the Spaceman in with my hand and told them to look up at the skies. And when they did, the cloud above us turned into a rocket ship and then it began to rain. Doug paused for a moment. I began using the telekinesis it gave me to alter the way people shot and pool. If I focused my mind on the ball, the ball would switch directions, and I could make a bit of money this way. Doug paused again. Then one day when I was sitting on the toilet, I started to black out, and I could feel the demons trying to pull me into the toilet. Doug paused. When I finally arrived back home from Okinawa, I turned on the news to find out that six tornadoes were following me. Whenever I passed under a street lamp, the lamp would flicker. Ever since then, I knew the gods were out to get me. One day, when I was out on a walk, I touched a flower, and it was a different color than the other flowers in the vicinity, and it wasn't budding. I touched it, and it opened, and inside was... Frank interrupted and said, Aren't you being a bit mendicious? A few people boo booed the interruption. I don't mind Frank here, he's just jealous of despite the fact imbued with him being a genius. That pales in comparison to being chosen for something truly great like myself. I'm not sure if anyone here has heard of the documentary called Random Lunacy or not, or if anyone here has had a fellow by the name of Papa Neutrino or not, but Mr. Frank Ziska kind of reminds me of that dude. Mr. Ziska here thinks that just because he was descended from some one-eyed general that he's special and he knows everything, don't you, Frank? But Frank has no armies to lead, and he never gave birth to any families. Frank responds, I never claimed to be a descendant from John Ziska. However, I believe Plato once said something about how every person should give birth, if not to a child, then at least to an idea. And I think I've been pregnant with an idea, though. 
no idea how long it will come to the time, nor how I will introduce this child to the world, but rest assured, as far as mental vicinity is concerned, I'm not barren. However, you, Douglas, are simply giving birth to surrogate babies where the rightful mother is LSD. Douglas speaks, oh, oh, I see. So you just think I did a lot of drugs during those days. Well, maybe I did. Maybe it's all bullshit. Maybe everything is meaningless, and I should just walk around like you pulling my pajamas out of my ass crack and blowing my nose in public. Fuck it. Doug lifts up his leg and farts. Everyone laughs. <coughs> Is it a crime if I'm a putting out my Ukraine? Everyone cracks up. Hell, let's just get back to some more music. Who wants to hear me play Johnny Cash as I hurt myself today? Uh, Doug begins to pick up his guitar. Today, see how it would feel. You know what? Speaking of politics. I know what it's like to be in war, and so do you, Mr. Ziska, descendant of the great general, who here thinks the Iraq war was a good idea. Everybody boos, boos, and shouts, and fuck no. Well, this genius over here supported George Bush and thought it was a great idea, didn't you, Frank? Carl says, I think we can all agree it was a bad idea, and you know what they say in their minds, they all like it, don't ya? Frank responds, I'm well aware of saying regarding great minds and thinking alike, but if I may throw in my few cents, I think the saying should be inverted. It seems much more the case that morons all seem to think alike and geniuses tend to think for themselves. And no, I never supported George Bush. I do, however, think from a philosophical foundation that the Iraq War was a good idea. It was just the thing to do. And Carl, if you had a dollar for every brain cell in your head, you'd have a quarter. Carl says, now hold on, Frank, <laughs> do you know how many people died in the Iraq war? You know what our soldiers did to innocent people? Are you really such a colonious that you think it all right for one country to invade another based on a lie about weapons of mass destruction? Please provide some detailed answers. Frank responds, right, so let's say we know a certain criminal is at this location, and if we get information that he's holding a knife. Now, this criminal, we know for sure that he is a murderer, and that he has been in possession of knives before. So the cops apprehend the suspect, and no knife is found. Did we just say, back away, whoa, 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 we thought we had a knife. But now that we know he doesn't, we have to let him go. Is that what we should say? Carl interrupts and says, so you think America has the right to be a world police? And who voted for them to be? Frank says, so let's try to dig out our blade deep in this Gordian knot so that we may really try to finally slice it open. Did you vote for the cops to be in existence here in America? We need cops. And if they sometimes do the wrong thing and sometimes they are assholes, sure. We need to sometimes risk more lives than we need to save in order to keep the principle of justice alive. When the Kurds are being threatened with genocide, should we have just sat back and practiced utilitarian ethics and had done some moral math, or should we stick to our deontological path of doing what is right no matter what the loss is? Sometimes no. Every time it is worth it to save one captive soldier, and if many soldiers die on the mission, even more so if it's an innocent civilian. The soldier has said he was willing to die for a cause, but the civilian hasn't volunteered to play this game. As long as the army wasn't a drafted army, then it is morally sound. No, I don't think we should approach what we took was right. I believe in liberation, but not in occupation. Carl molds over what was said for a moment and responds, mm, That seems like a pretty reasonable answer, but I've never found myself capable of stomaching much of the nutty, greedy, right wings bullshit. Not that I'd myself be a liberal either, but I would call myself a Democrat. But you make a good case. Well, see, here's where your Dick Thomas thinking has gotten us. I'm not a right-wing guy or a Republican, nor do I consider myself a conservative. If anything, I usually label myself a liberal, though since liberals aren't so liberal anymore, I suppose I might accept the title of libertarian, says Frank. But I assume you don't vote that way. That would be wasting your vote, am I correct in my assumption? Frank responds, voting for a third party is a wasted vote? No, my friend, it is the only game in town if you want your vote to count at all. Why vote for either of the two main parties? They already know they are going to win, and so they don't plan on changing things up one bit. 
So if you vote for the party that wins, maybe, so what? How does that make your vote count? They laugh at your vote. They could throw it away and win without it. However, if you vote for a third party, then your vote truly does count. For one thing, your vote is proportionately larger as a percentage influence than it would have been voting for one of the expected parties. But more importantly, you are actually voting for something rather than just voting for the status quo. If you vote for either a Democrat or Republican, you are just showing up to say, yeah, I'm fine with the way things are, which may be true, but you could just as easily do that at home without voting at all and thus saving your precious time, even if they don't win. Even if they won't win, it's still worth it to vote for them because it will mean more to the cause than voting for a team that doesn't need nor care about your vote. The only way to not waste your vote is to vote for the underdog and to try and shake up the system. Well, on another well-argued point, Douglas, he may have something here after all, says Carl. <sighs> Doug sips his drink and responds, Well, don't look at me. I just play the guitar. I leave the kusurshi and sophist and you, Carl. I'll leave it up to you. Bill finally speaks. And Frank and I are both in our in agreement in that we oppose gay marriage. Another failure of Dick Tomius thinking, thus proving the dangerous aspects of it. The idea that you and I agree on this issue is totally fallacious. Sure, I'm against gay marriage, but I'm also against heterosexual marriage. Oh, well, at least I agree with you that it was smart to liberate the Kurds from genocidal maniac Saddam Hussein. Douglas gets involved and says, Bill, do you even know what area the Kurds are from? Of course I do, Kurdville. Everyone starts laughing. Douglas says, Bill, did you know that the word gullible isn't even in the dictionary? It isn't, Bill asks. No, because it's on the ceiling. Bill looks up. Everyone starts laughing. Bill smiles and looks down at everyone. Then Bill looks back up. I don't know, I still don't see it up there. Frank and Douglas both pat Bill on the back. Doug says, don't worry, Bill, we aren't laughing at you. We're just laughing with the people that are laughing at you. Frank Ziska spots a fortune cookie laying on the table. He picks it up, unwraps it, and breaks it in two. He crumbles up the fortune inside without glancing at it and throws it in the trash. He then throws the two bits in his mouth. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Bill says, oh, so did Douglas tell you guys about our mission? What mission, Carl asks. We're going to visit each and every state of the continental U.S., and this is number 47. Why, Carl asks. I don't know. It seems like fun to me, responds Bill. Carl turns to Douglas and repeats, why? Well, it's better than sitting around waiting to die, isn't it? I've always wanted to travel, and when you don't have a house or a family or a business to run, it makes it a lot easier, doesn't it? I mean, in the sense that you don't have those things to stick around and take care of, says Doug. If you guys are devoted to this goal, and you would go through all this trouble just to accomplish something so silly, why not actually do something that would make you a success, asks Carl. What does it mean to be successful, asks Frank. To own a car, a house, to have a nice job, to be able to eat at fancy restaurants and visit Disneyland, says Carl. <clears throat> is it that objectively what success is? Or is that what success just for the individual who wanted that and achieved that? Or is it success decided by a subjective consensus? I think the objective definition of being successful is to successfully become happy. And that the path will lead you to the state is subjective to the individual's tastes. Success shouldn't be decided by others or economic situation. It should be decided by the man who defines himself as successful and genuinely believes it to be true. Because that a man is a happy man and happiness is the ultimate success, speaks Frank Ziska. And do you consider yourself happy, asks Carl. I think I am, says Frank. You don't seem that happy, says Carl. What do you expect a happy man to look like? <sighs> you expect him to hop around with a big stupid grin on his face while avidly whistling away from his work. I don't want to be that kind of happy. I just want to enjoy the moments of my life without feeling depressed or pessimistic or cynical. Like Douglas tends to be these days, says Frank. We are headed out to Gatlinburg in the morning.
And then we will cross over the river number 48, North Carolina, the following day, says Bill. Well, I wish you good luck to you fellows for sure. And I hope it brings you the happiness you expect it to, says Carl. I don't want to say some cliche, like how it isn't about the destination, it's about the journey. However, I do feel that we are taking the right path by setting little waypoints for ourselves. Each and every new state we enter into brings a sense of accomplishment. So it's not necessarily about the journey or the big destination, but the little waypoints in between. I think that's what happiness is all about. Finding little success as you go along your route, speaks Frank Siska. One of the fellows running the shelter appears and asks to speak to the three of them. It seems we have performed a miscalculation, good sirs. We are short regarding the bed situation. We only have about two beds free for the lot of you. So if you chaps still want to stay, I'm afraid you will have to dismiss one of your fellows, says the shelter worker. All three of them shake their head, and Douglas says, No, we couldn't possibly abandon each other. Well, then it seems like you fellows will have to find yourselves another place to stay for the night, says the worker. The worker then walks off. Carl says, Damn, that sucks, man. What are you guys going to do? Well, I guess we'll just have to be all right, won't we? I suppose I don't need to sleep on no bed tonight. I suppose I can just sleep out in the alleyway in my rain tonight, but I guess that will just have to be all right, won't it? I mean, I like sleeping in a bed, but then again, some people like to eat cat shit, and others like to suck truckers' dicks, so I guess that'll just have to be all right. Because opinions don't count for much these days, speaks Douglas. Frank says, opinions are like assholes. If you don't have one, then you are all full of shit. Carl says, <laughs> you guys crack me up, you stupid sons of bitches. Hey, Carl, what's the difference between you and a baby, asked Doug. What's that? asked Carl. The baby has seen a pussy in the last six months. Good one. Hey, guys, did you know Douglas yet won a stand contest with a mirror? Yeah, he's staring at it and he shattered. Hey, Carl, did you ever attempt this suicide by beating your face in with an ugly stick? Because I can tell you got pretty close. Ah, uh, make uh, like an asexual and go fuck yourself. Douglas says, all right, see you later, masturbator. After a while, pedophiles, responds Carl. Carl walks off into the sleeping quarters. Our three travelers depart from the homeless shelter back into the dark night. They begin walking aimlessly. Frank, maybe Carl was right. Maybe we should just have higher standards for the goals we set, says Douglas. What are the benefits of high standards? Low standards provide you with a longer list of satisfying options that are easier to attain, says Frank. Maybe you are right, and I do enjoy what we are doing, but I don't know, man. Look, says Frank, we have almost accomplished our mission. If you can think of something to aim for once this is over with, we can discuss it then. Well, I think we do have some important small goals we might need to be considering right now, says Doug. What's that, asks Frank. Where the fuck are we going to sleep, asks Doug. Frank surveys the area. That looks like a car lot over there. Maybe we should go sneak into one of those cars and spend the night inside there, says Frank. It looks spooky, says Bill. I agree with you, Bill, but I am sleepy as shit, says Douglas. We should flip a quarter to decide whether we sleep here or keep walking, suggests Bill. You expect any of us to have any money on us, says Frank. Hold on, man, I do have this lucky wheat penny, says Douglas. All right, that'll do. If it lands on heads, we head on. And if it lands on tails, we park our tails here, says Frank. Douglas and Bill nod. Doug throws the penny up in the air, and it lands on the street. All of them bend over and squint their eyes. Tails, says Frank. Lucky penny my ass. Fuck this spot. Let's keep walking, fellas. I'm getting an eerie vibe from this place, says Douglas. Frank chuckles. Well, 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 two superstitions battling it out. 
how do you decide which one to put your faith in, the penny or the intu 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 intuition, said, asked Frank. Shut up and walk, says Doug. The group finally arrives at a bridge by the highway. All right, now this seems like a decent place to lay our heads, doesn't it, Bill? Doesn't it, Frank? Bill nods. Sure, says Frank. They walk up to the side of the bridge and lay down there. Frank pulls out his book. Ah, shit, exclaims Frank. What's the matter, says Douglas. I lit my fucking lantern on that truck. Well, I guess you can just wait until morning to read on, then, can't you, Frank? But reading also helps me get all sophomoric. Yeah, I know what you mean. I mostly only read to help me go to sleep. It's funny. Reading is one of those activities that is both hard work and yet is also associated with sleep. I wonder what the great testicles would have to say on the matter, asks Doug, says Doug. Frank laid down and stared up at the bridge, blocking the stars. We are too independent, you know that, Doug. How so, asks Doug. People always speak of the virtues of independence, but we don't live in an independent world. We don't, asks Doug. Nope. We all depend on the sun to rise and our cars to run. Everything is interdependent. You have to learn to please people, Douglas. You can't be self-sufficient and make anything of yourself. The world demands specialization, and specialization means that we must all be independent on one another. Huh, says Doug. No one appreciates how well off they are these days. They imagine how good it would be to be king. But do they realize that they live better than any king of the Middle Ages ever did? None of those kings had air conditioning, movies, video games, cell phones, or refrigerators. They had to shit in a chamber pot because they had no fucking plumbing system. No one appreciates how well off they are. The whole town would smell like shit back then because the feces would be flung into the street. The trickle-down system works after all. If people understood what it meant... It doesn't mean that income equality will be reduced, but rather it means that even if you suffer the worst income equality, you will start to get some of the benefits of a modern society passed to you, or rather, technological benefits will trickle down to you. Money won't trickle down, but reduced prices will. Even us, we are all capable of reading. We are all literate. Even some of us refuse to take advantage of that. We just got fed a decent meal earlier, and we enjoyed an air-conditioned building. You gotta play the guitar to socialize, but no one understands that these things are getting better year after year. What is the chief concern about poor people these days? That they are obese? That they eat like shit and could die of a heart attack from overconsumption? I could imagine the impoverished and... People long ago fantasizing of a future utopia where even the poorest citizens of the country would be able to die the perfect death, eating until their arteries clogged and they died of being too fat. We are living the dream! And people are bitching about consumerism? The complaint being that we have too much shit and too much distraction? Distraction from what? Misery? Are we forgetting how miserable we used to be before we had so much shit to keep us entertained? Rants Frank Ziska. Douglas seems to have passed out. Frank looks over at Bill. Bill seems to be spaced out or possibly praying. The problem is a concept called relative deprivation. I learned the term from Ma Malcolm Gladwell, if I recall correctly. Did you guys know that the highest suicide rates are in countries that have the highest standard of living? It turns out to be true that misery veritably does love company. People don't care about how well off they are if other people have it better than they do. People want to see people suffer as much as they do. I guess it's similar to the crab mentality they speak about in the Philippines, speaks Frank Siska. Anyway, it's hot tonight. I'm taking off my pantaloons. Morning approaches. Our three vagabonds start to toss and turn, still under the bridge. Somebody in a car shouts, Get off, job, you bums! Frank says, I've got one, sitting on my ass 24-7. The pay is shit, but the benefits are worth it. <coughs> Frank picks up his book to read, but a cop stops under the bridge. The cop and his partner get out and start to question Frank. Why don't you have your pants on? It's hot out. Couldn't sleep. Put your pants on, says the officer. 
Why should I put on my clothes to appeal your eyes? I feel more comfortable like this. If anyone doesn't feel comfortable staring at me, then they gladly can choose to look the other way. Why should I be forced to be uncomfortable just because the common man doesn't know how to avert his eyes when he sees something he does not like? It could be kids. Do you think of that, asked the officer? Well, God forbid they see a man in his underwear. And shall we outlaw mirrors for them children's too, so that they won't have to see themselves getting dressed? And shall we forbid them to look down at the bodies when they're in the bath for fear they might be exposed to images of genitalia, be it their own or not? Why should that matter? Rants, Francisca. Sir, if you don't put your clothes back on, I'm going to haul your ass to jail. You understand? Asked the cop. You would desire. You would deny to provide. Free. You you would. you room Free room and board? Asked Frank. The partner says, ah, shit, Ron. You know we can't haul these bums into jail. They'll only thank us. Yes, yeah, says Frank. We can't let people think that modern justice is hospitable or anything. Justice about wrath and punishment. It should be only used to make people happy in the sense that others get a kick out of suffering of others. That's why jail exists and why people want hell to exist. Can't stand the side of everyone having a good time, even our enemies. No, someone needs to suffer. And while we have a good time, it makes everything complete. Rants, Francisca. Jack, relax, I got this. Now listen here, bum. I may not arrest you, but I can take you somewhere and beat the shit out of you, and no one will care, nor believe you. If you say anything, do you understand me? Asks Officer Ron. Well, where a gun begins, morality ends. I will put my pants back on if I am coerced into doing so, whether I believe it to be an injustice or not. Frank puts his pants back on and Officer Ron and Jack get back in their vehicle. Frank sports a barbecue sandwich on the dash of their patrol car. He spots a barbecue pork sandwich. Frank points to the sandwich and says, Whoa there, boys! That's cannibalism! Officer Ron gives him a look before departing the scene. Douglas sits up now and says, You know, Frank, sometimes I think you aim to be the world's number one loser. Good, I'd be honored to finally hold a record. Mr. Frank Ziska, you really have no dignity at all, do you? Tell me, Douglas, what is this meretricious item you call dignity? Respect for yourself and for your body, Frank. Ah, so I'm the only one disrespecting my body by being comfortable with showing it off without any shame in the world. Yet, you may be right. Maybe the Muslim man who hides his woman under hijab is more is doing it because of a virtue called dignity. Yes, Islam. Not just the religion of peace, but also the religion renowned for the respect of women's rights. Dignity is a word used for whore shaming, and is usually followed by a command of hide your shame. But good Sir Douglas, isn't it they who should hide their shame by, fuck, by shutting the fuck up? Isn't my body mine to respect in my own way? Isn't respect something an individual can decide but shouldn't be left up to those outside the individual to decide? Isn't the whole... Isn't the whole point of respect... So, isn't it... Isn't, if they disrespect me and my body when they say my body should be the scene of those, but those, they project shame on my, project it. But it is they who feel ashamed. They are ashamed of the human body, but I am not a man. I respect in my body by not hiding it. I am telling my body that I am not ashamed to be seen in public with it. Rants, Frank Siska. Bill asks, is that why you... Scratch your ass in public then, Frank? Well, you'd like yourself, wouldn't you, Bill? You'd like... But that meretricious modesty imprisons you to endure that niggling sensation. What good has modesty done for you or for society? No, true progress would be overcoming thereby pseudo-virtues like modesty and dignity, says Frank. Another bum on the other side of the road is holding a sign that says, We'll work for food. A van approaches the bum. That's a construction van, Frank. I know one when I see one. I sure miss driving around in one. They overhear the driver of the van offering to give work to a fellow vagrant. 
The Vanguard just grits his teeth and says, Get out of here! Keep driving! Well, I guess some people just want the free handouts and would rather not work. Construction isn't a trade for everyone, is it, Frank? asked Douglas. It wasn't my favorite line of work, but it has its charms, says Frank. Another car pulls up next to our three vagabonds, and a teenager, maybe young adult, steps out. The kid is wearing a shirt that says, Eat, Right, Stay Fit, Die Anyway. The kid motions for them to come over. Only Douglas gets up and moseys on over there. He notices that there is another young fellow in the passenger side and another chap in the back seat. Well, hello there, fellas. What is it that you need to inquire with me about? asks Douglas. Look, says the kid, I need some more people to ride with us. We have some people we need to fuck up, you understand? I've seen bomb fights. I know you fellas are capable of fucking shit up. Because you guys just don't give a fuck. And you will slit your mother's neck for a nickel. So if you hobos would be interested in joining my gang for a quick minute, I will, the kid walks around to his trunk and opens it, be willing to provide you with all the cheese sandwiches you can eat. The trunk is filled with cheese sandwiches. Why the fuck do you have to make cheese sandwiches, kid? That's Frank. So I can recruit an army. You plan on recruiting an army of homeless people to do your bidding by luring them out with the promise of cheese sandwiches. Well, some of them have turkey in them, but that costed a bit more. But if you do a good job, who knows, man? I might even give you two turkey and cheese sandwiches. Kid, you're crazy, but I'll tell you what. My friend Frank over there... Doug points to him. We'll probably suck your dick for a sandwich. Hell, he might even suck all three of your dicks so all of us can get a sandwich. Hey, Bill, you want a sandwich? Shouts Doug. Yeehaw! Shouts Bill back. It's only got cheese on it! Shouts Doug. I don't mind! Shouts Bill. Doug shouts. Hey, Frank, come suck this guy's dick so we can get a sandwich! The kid says, no, that's fine. Kid pulls out his wallet and says, Look, I have a fat wallet. How about I pay you in cash after the job is done? Douglas laughs and said, Kid, the day of the fat wallet symbolizing wealth is over. Now it is a symbol of poverty. The rich now keep all their money on a debit card or a credit card or two. You probably have that thing loaded down with store loyalty discount cards. I bet your Food City card you got you a great deal on those cheese sandwiches, those, though, didn't it? Frank walks up to them and says, All right, whose dick is it? Do I have to suck to get one of them cheese sandwiches? The kid says, You aren't getting any sandwiches for sucking dick, you faggots. Frank says, All right, and points to the kid and then his friends. I'll suck all your dicks free of charge just because I love it so much. I just ask you to let me swallow because a poor bum like me needs his protein shake. <laughs> the kid says, if you cocksuckers don't get away from my car right now, I'm going to beat the ever-loving shit out of all of you. Frank leans on the car, staring at the kids inside, and runs his tongue side to side on the window pane. That's it, you motherfuckers! The kid punches Doug in the side of the head, and the two other kids pop out and start wailing on Frank. Bill runs over and pops one of the kids and knocks him out. Frank and Douglas are clutching themselves on the pavement. The kids still standing focus their attention on Bill. One grabs him and pushes him against the car while the other unleashes a barrage into his gut. Frank spots a brick laying on the road, picks it up, and nails the kid, wailing Bill with it. The kid retreats and tends to his injury. Bill headbutts the little shit behind him and breaks his nose. The three little bastards get back into the car and drive off. Frank laughs. Douglas says, Shit, Frank, you're crazy. You almost got us all killed. Bill's a badass, though. You can't underestimate him. One time we were building a house together. He punched the fucking wall. I swear to God, it crumbled to the ground. Witnessed it with my own eyes. Bill came to join them, clutching his stomach and groaning. Bill manages to finally ask, What the fuck did you idiots do? I don't feel like walking all day. Let's go to the bus station, says Frank. With what money, you retard? Asked Doug. Leave that up to me, says Frank. Jesus, Frank! Douglas shakes his head. They arrive at the bus station. Well, Frank, your move, says Douglas. I got this. A gentleman walks past them, and Frank gets up and approaches him. Doug watches. The hell? Get away from me, you sick fuck! Yells the gentleman. No luck, huh? Asks Douglas. I'm gonna go hang out in the restroom. 
Maybe I can find a Republican senator in there. Frank enters the restroom. Douglas looks over at Bill, and Bill has his eyes closed with his hands together, engaging in a silent form of glossolalia, with only his lips moving but devoid of sound. Bill is rubbing his belly. Doug shakes his head. About 20 minutes later, Frank comes out of the bathroom. Doug looks over at him. I got some ching-ching, says Frank. The dick did you have to suck this time, asks Douglas. No, not at all. Douglas, it's just a simple handy this time. Douglas shakes his head. Doesn't that shit gross you out, Frank? Gross is a state of mind that needs to be overcome, Douglas. It is a human weakness. Wouldn't you rather live in a world where you didn't find things gross? Especially if engaging yourself in that activity further advancement into whatever goal you have set for yourself. Easier said than done, says Doug. If what we enjoyed was a choice... Anyone that was in distress would be a masochist. Well, that's the fun of a challenge. The hard part, isn't it, asked Frank. <laughs> Douglas doesn't say anything. Frank tosses a few bucks at Doug and says, Procure me a drink, Douglas. Doug gives him a look. I'm on now. There's a convenience store adjacent to this building. Get something alcoholic this time. I feel like singing Dithyrams to Dionysus for a change, to take a break from following the light of Apollo. Well, maybe I can go get my own drink, and it'll be your turn in the next time in the restroom, says Frank. Well, I guess that'll just have to be all right. Bill snaps out of entrance and says, Ooh, get me one too. My stomach is still killing me. Doug returns with the alcohol, and they sit outside the bus station while drinking. Thought you said you were a straight edge, Mr. Zitka, says Bill. No, 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 no. I specifically use the term semi-straight edge, says Bill. There is no such thing, Frank. Even better, it means I'm an innovator now, Doug asks. So tell me about this semi-straight edge business, Frank. How does it work? Well, Frank says, it provides me with the ultimate freedom of being right in the middle without prison bars on my left or prison bars on my right. <clears throat> it means that I am not self-imprisoning myself by refusing to try a certain substance for arbitrary reasons, but at the same time, I won't let myself become imprisoned by habits or addictions. I can try whatever I want so long as I don't become dependent upon them, and I have the power of will to do this without total abstinence. Yeah, you might call me an Epicurean, but even Epicurean's perfect moderation was a specific control method. I am free to indulge in whatever I may choose, though I rarely choose to engage at all. When I do do it, it is an escape into this world, only to amplify my enjoyment of reality. Frank looks at Bill, who is still clutching his belly, and says, Bill, are you all right? I'm fine. The bus arrives, and our trio of adventurers begin to approach begin their approach through Gatlinburg and into the Smoky Mountains. I should have told you to pick us up something to eat, says Frank. Well, too late now, says Doug. Frank reaches under his chair and then puts his hand on the floor. He finds a chip and throws it in his mouth. Douglas shakes his head. Frank, I just, I just have no more words left for this shit. Frank says, if what you are going to eat isn't going to taste bad or cause you any he health problems, why dig for psychologically gross issues for reason not to eat a certain food? Doug says, eating chips off the floor on a public bus might not be the healthiest shit to eat, Frank. Frank shrugs and says, I'll take my chances. Frank turns to Bill and says, Frank here used to be, look forward to kid's egg in his house so that he could have breakfast. Bill laughs. Doug continues. Hell, one time Frank was eating a chocolate bar inside a Walmart and I told him he was stealing it, but he had told me he'd return it to their restroom in about 30 minutes. <laughs> Doug continues laughing. Douglas says to Frank, I took, you up for, I took up for you the other day. Someone said that your mom was easy, but I told them it took you a lot of work. Frank continues looking out the window, seeing the bus pass, go-kart arenas, and bungee diving stations, but not responding. Frank, I'm implying that you used to fuck your mother. You, you there, Frank? Frank starts laughing. What? asks Doug. Diogenes and furs, says Frank. The fuck does that mean? asks Doug. It would take a long time to explain, and explaining it would ruin the fun. I get a kick out of referencing inside jokes that no one gets, and this is one of those ultimate inside jokes, because it is totally 
inside my head. It is a joke only my mind and I can understand. No one says anything for a moment. Finally, Frank speaks again. Do you know what I like about these public buses the most? The free food? asked Doug. No, I like that no one is wearing a suit. I'm glad I'm not the kind of successful that we have talked about recently. Because look at all these people on TV. They all wear the same fucking suits. Maybe they have a different colored tie or something like that. But it's always a goddamn suit. Seeing suits makes me sick. Not that I have a problem with them intrinsically. But I just wish politicians and television pundits could change up their wardrobe every once in a while. But now look at these poor people on this bus. And the poor people you see shopping at Walmart. These are the people who always wear something exciting and unpredictable. Douglas interrupts and says, Like those goofy fucking pajamas? Precisely. And the best thing about these goofy fucking pajamas is that they come in a variety of colors and styles. But some poor people don't even wear pants. Eh, that sounds familiar. Doug interrupts again. Or oh, shirts! I don't know whether it is because they don't give a fuck or not... I but I just appreciate the visual variety that they offer my eyes, so I am glad for that. When's the last time you got f laid, Frank? Asked Douglas. Do the hand jobs and blow jobs count? Douglas shakes his head. You know, Douglas, I think women might be right when they say a man thinks with his penis. I think the brain must be in the penis, Douglas. I think it would explain a lot. That's why men think with them, and women don't think at all. Is that something the wise testicle spoke of? Asked Frank. I think so, says Douglas. And it makes me wonder just how big of a dick Einstein had on him. What are you thinking about over there, Bill? Asked Frank. I hear when you flush the toilet that the fecal matter will rise up and spread out onto your bathroom items, such as your toothbrush. I wonder if that's true. Douglas says, well, that would explain that shit-eating grin you always have on your face. Bill smiles. Douglas says, you two sure can fuzzle the fuck out of me. Bill is always speaking about Jesus or some random shit, and Frank, you are always saying meaningless philosophical shit. You are thoroughly unpractical. Frank says, my philosophical premises allow me to get us a bus ticket, didn't it? Douglas says, I don't think it was philosophy that made you good at sucking dick or jerking off cocks. Really, Frank, what good is philosophy for? Will it get me a job? How about a car or a beach house? No philosophy probably won't get you any of those things. But all those things you do for philosophy. How so? Why do you say that? Asked Doug. Why is it that you want those things? Asked Frank. Because they would make me happy. How do you know? Asked Frank. And what about them would make you happy? How long will they make you happy? Douglas speaks. All right, I'm not going down this path with you again. It takes up too much time. It's common sense why I want those things. And, and the common people are known for their excellent sense of sense, aren't they? God daggies, Frank. Are you fucking with me? You like fucking with Bill, don't you? Suddenly, the bus breaks down. Douglas speaks. Well, I guess the gods are after me again. Just my luck. I guess that'll just have to be alright, though, won't it, guys? Oh, guys, in all seriousness, this is really a bad sign. We should get off this bus, I think, Bill says. Calm down, says Frank. Mm. I was sort of joking at first, you know, but maybe Bill is right. I'm starting to get that feeling, too, says Doug. Oh, ye fucking retard, says Frank. I expect this from Bill, but come on, Douglas. You're smarter than that. You know there is no God. Doug says, no, it's not God. It's karma. Karma? What have we done wrong? Asks Frank. Maybe it was you sucking all those dicks. I don't know. But I know this is a bad sign, says Douglas. Oh, for fuck's sake, Doug, if karma exists, then why did Anne Frank die so young in such poor condition? And why are shady businessmen like Donald Trump and Rupert Murdoch still alive and living the good life? Does that make sense to you? And karma requires judgment or justice. 
How can you have judgment without a conscious being that is doing the judging? And if this omnipotent justice exists, what can you call it other than God? No, Douglas, if you believe in karma, then you must also believe in God, and the two are inextricable from each other. Rants, Frank Siska. I just feel it, okay? I don't have time to rack my brain over your bullshit sophistry. Bill and I are getting off this bus, and we will walk the rest of the way to the Smoky Mountains. Join us if you'd like, says Douglas. Frank shakes his head. Find you fucking superstitious morons. I'll entertain your bullshit. The three of them departed from the potentially haunted bus and begin their trek again on foot. They walk through the beautiful town of Gatlinburg in Tennessee. They finally arrive at the Smoky Mountains. Well, this is our final adventure in the tree state, boys, so let's pick a proper trail to walk on. You only get one shot, so make it a good one, says Frank. Well, this one looks good. You can walk behind a waterfall. It's called Grotto Falls, says Bill. Well, let's do this shit then, shall we? asks Douglas. Yes, let's, says Frank. Our trio of adventuring vagabonds walks up to the steep tree-infested mountain. They see beautiful streams as they go, and they look over the edge of the cliffs and see beautiful vistas. They finally reach their climax. They see the waterfall, and they stand behind it, looking out through the translucent crashing waves. Frank Ziska sticks his head out into the water and says, Come on, fellas, let's get wet. No, Doug says. I'm just enjoying the view. Bill, clutching his stomach again, begins to rant for the first time. Guys, how can you see these beautiful creations? Doubt for a second that there is a god. I'll become an atheist once I see the Mona Lisa paint itself. But until that day comes, I stand back in awe. Look at the trees here. Look at those birds. Look at the water. How can this exist without a painter? Did the canvas fall and land in just the right organization of paint? Frank is still enjoying the waterfall and says nothing. Douglas speaks up. Yeah, well, if God is such a good painter, then why did he give up after he painted the earth, huh? And why did he abandon us in the universe to utter chaos? Tell me that then, Bill. Why did he abandon us? Bill continues his rant. Because everyone stopped believing. Doug says, you know how many Christians there are in the world, Bill? They call themselves Christians, but they mock every person that really believes. They tell us that the Bible is up to subjective inter interpretation. They justify homosexuality, even though the Bible expressly forbids it. It says in, right there in the Bible, but yet these nominal Christians think that they can interpret the words of God in their own way. And you call those Christians? I was gifted with the Holy Ghost, and God talks to me personally. I was given the ability to speak in tongues by Jesus himself. Yet Christians call me crazy. I wouldn't mind being called crazy by people that didn't accept that label, but coming from people that think they believe as I do, it's downright insulting. They should know better. Sometimes I think maybe Nietzsche had a point. Not that God is dead, but that the ability for common man to know God that is dead. <clears throat> the day when I could speak to my fellow believer about the truth of heaven and salvation is over. Now every liberal Christian tells me atheists, homosexuals, and Muslims go to heaven. Not just heaven, but their own form of heaven. They think that you can choose your afterlife, like you can choose what restaurant you want to eat at. What the fuck is wrong with these fools? They'll burn in hell. And you, Douglas, you will burn in hell if you don't change your ways. Frank as well, but he isn't listening right now. And you think I say this is an enemy, but I don't. I say this is a friend. A nominal Christian doesn't care what happens to your soul, but I warn you like a man shouting at a kid standing in front of an oncoming train. I say, get off the trucks, you fool, or you will be run down and your guts will coat the tracks. So I tell you how horrible your suffering will be in hell. Understand why I do it. It is my duty as a Christian. Doug pauses for a moment and says, I think despite the fact that you are a fool about this matter, that I respect you in a way for saying it like you did. I can understand how you feel, Bill. However, to be honest, hell doesn't really sound that bad to me. I'm sure I'd adjust to the temperature <clears throat> after a few hundred years, and the winters would always be pleasant. You jest, Douglas. you jest. But these are serious matters. So I wish this time, this one time, 
that you would try to speak seriously. Frank pisses me off sometimes, but at least he's serious about all matters, says Bill. Fine then, Bill, let me ask you this. How many people, percentage-wise, do you think will end up in hell, says Douglas, asks Douglas. I'd say at least maybe 80, 90 percent, 90 if not more, but I'm not the judge, so I couldn't say for sure. So you are telling me that God's job is to educate us and to save our soul, and yet he fails 90% of the time? With a failure rate like that, any teacher would be fired, Bill. Frank steps out from the waterfall and jokes. Obviously, Doug, you've never attended community college. Doug speaks again. Besides, Bill, if I had a choice, I'd be a Scientologist. It is the best religion money can buy. You know, Frank became religious the other day. Yeah, he looked in the mirror and found God. Oh, and Bill, the next time you find God, please, take a fucking picture. Bill says, well, at least you believe in something, Douglas. But Frank doesn't believe in anything. Frank says, when a religious person says that an atheist believes in nothing, it is more telling of how few things a religious person truly believes in. Bill shakes his head, looking a bit despondent, and says, if religion is blind optimism, full of wishful thinking, then atheists are blind cynics. Frank looks up in the sky and says, come on, guys, we still have to get to North Carolina to finish this up. They find another train leading out of Tennessee and into North Carolina, and they hop into another boxcar. Douglas throws his guitar case inside and opens it up. All right, good friends, let's play a goodbye song for Tennessee. How about Don McLean's Castle in the Air? Bill, for once, isn't saying anything. Frank turns to Douglas and nod. Douglas begins playing. They are about to arrive in North Carolina. Guys, here it comes. Are you excited or what? This is what we worked so hard to accomplish, says Douglas. I'm ready, says Frank. Are you ready over there, Bill? asks Doug. Bill doesn't respond. Douglas walks over to him and shakes him. Douglas stands there for a moment. Frank, I think Bill is dead. What? Frank walks up to Bill and starts shaking him frantically. He's not moving, Frank! Frank turns him over and slaps him on the face. Frank, don't do that! It's fucking disrespectful! I'm trying to wake him up, you fool! He's not dead! Why would he be dead? He was clutching his stomach the whole time. I'm not sure if you noticed. You always spacing out into abstract thought, but I saw it. I didn't know it was this bad, but... Frank looks at Douglas and says, Then it's my fault? I brought this along because I was acting like an idiotic fool to pester those little shits earlier? No, of course not. It's ain't no fun off your fault, man. You didn't know what was going to happen. You are a psychic. Things just have unforeseen consequences. You can't beat yourself up over it. Frank sits down, looking emotional for the first time, but not yet crying. Doug pauses for a moment and says, What are we going to do with the body? Bury it, Frank says. What's the point? Chunk that shell out of the train. You fucking with me again, Frank? This is Bill. No, it isn't. It's a shell. It's like keeping old clothes and saying that the clothes are your friend because he used to wear them. Bill's consciousness, or soul if you prefer, is no longer in there. Do you understand me, Douglas? Douglas says, well, it seems disrespectful. Frank responds, It's not disrespectful to Bill. You only find it disrespectful to yourself because you haven't analyzed the situation properly. Now I'll grab the legs and you grab the arms and let's toss them into the woods. Maybe the animals can eat his flesh and it can go into a good cause. Just like giving away an old sweater to someone else to find some use for it. Bill won't need this old carcass anymore, whether he is in heaven or Candyland or non-existent. This thing no longer serves a purpose for him. Douglas shakes his head but follows the advice, and they chunk Bill outside of the car. Wise Tisticles says you may lose everyone you love, but necrophiliac will love everyone you've lost, says Douglas. Frank responds, you can either laugh or cry in these situations, Doug, and I think you've made a noble choice. It was a joke, maybe in bad tastes, but I'm still not laughing. Well, it's a start. I just feel bad that Bill never got to finish the mission, you know? 
Wish he would have at least been able to make it into North Carolina before departing, you know. God dang it. I just, I just, I just don't know, says Douglas. Doug, the point of the goals isn't to accomplish them while living, but rather to give you a distraction before you die. It's fine for him to die like this, like a soldier dying from the line of duty. The most depressing thing in the world would be to meet every goal you have set for yourself while you remain living. It would be like a movie that has reached its climax, but the credits never stop rolling. Frank pauses for a moment and says, Douglas, we may, we must give ourselves goals. We must keep improving ourselves every day. We must compensate for our deteriorating health and our soul being sucked out slowly into the void, which is the final destination. As long as you are alive, you have the time to do the things you regret not doing. And when you die, you have no awareness of regrets. So no one should worry about dying with regrets. Death is our home. Life is our travel vacation. Before we were alive, we were dead, and when our vacation is over, we will return back to our default state. We return home. We are just renting these bodies like a getaway beach house, and we have to deal with the accumulated depre depreciation of them. But, Doug, I don't want to live life as an Ouroboros, eating my own tail slowly as life fades away. Frank continues. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe we should kill our fantasies. When you have a fantasy, you feel a sense of jealousy toward those that you think got to experience that fantasy. By living out what you imagine to be great, you get to kill the fantasy for both you and the target of your envy. You get to share a knowing glance with that person that says, that's it. Maybe that is why the rich are more likely to kill themselves than the poor. The poor can stand in shit while looking at the mountaintops with some struggling to escape the shit while the rich stand atop and get a full view. That it's a whole shit mountain. And when you look up and they look up and they see nothing more to climb upwards for, at least that's when you have nothing. And you have the hope of something to look forward to. But what happens when you have everything and realize that everything is shit? Is it better to have nothing and think everyone has something better than you or to have everything and realize ultimately it is nothing? Goals are just waypoints on shit mountain, Doug. And I'm not sure if we should ever hope to reach the top or not. Douglas appears to be deep in pensive contemplation for a moment, but then turns to his buddy and asks, So, Mr. Frank Ziska, what's next?